Well, as you said, it, Jer, let's fucking do it. Let's, let's fucking do it. Let's fucking do it. Let's give so let's give something back to the people. Oh, and look how ph- philanthropic we're being right now. Give it yeah, as well. You know, I, rather than uh, as well as being philanthropic, Tom. Today I'm feeling quite conspiratorial. Yeah, well, I mean, it happens with men of our age. You start questioning everything. You're like, oh, really? Is that why it is? Oh. Why are all the tools right-handed? I mean, is it the left hand is the devil's hand? I mean, you know. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, a bit of me is like, why are the Tom and Jerry show kicking out the best content in Ireland and yet still so low in the charts? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who is trying to keep us down? What is not the fine listeners of the Tom and Jerry show? You guys are doing absolutely wonderful. There's a right. Hey, listen, we're rambling as we're known to do, Tom. But there's a reason why we're feeling quite conspiratorial on today's bonus episode. Would you like to tell the people why? It is, of course. The reason being is that we have the godfather of conspiracies. One of them is popular conspiracy theorists in the world. In the world Absolutely. Right now, which is something to behold. Homegrown. Homegrown. Uh, Daddy to many of our podcasts has helped us all out in some make, shape or form, realistically. There's a reason why I sound better today than I have any other day. It's because before we came out of this podcast, Gordo asked me, Hey, are you doing XYZ? And I sheepishly had to say, uh... Yeah. And he goes, no. Do you VW? And I was like, ah, oh, fuck, everyone does sound better now. Jesus Christ, I've been doing this for six months. Well, perfect timing to bring the man on. Everybody, sit back and enjoy the brilliant Gordo Rochford. Of course, we are delighted to have the Godfather of Irish podcasting, possibly oh. one of the, I, well, there's no possibly about it, one of the most successful podcasts in the world right now. Jesus Christ, I sa- tonight. I sounded very much like, see, I'm setting you up here. I know I sounded like Jeremy Clarkson in the world. I'm setting you up because, Gordo, we can't have you on and we all rubbing each other's back and telling everybody how successful you are because we need to take you down a peg or two. To come down uh, a yep. step or two. There's a few, few uh, matches I need to be taken down, to be fair. It's real simple, Gordo. You've You've... Far eclipsed anything me or Tom have ever done. So we've been invited you on to my worst gig ever just to <laughs> just to swing a double bladed axe at your fucking sequoia stature right now. I'm I I am my my self-esteem is uh you know in the process of being rehabilitated. So I'm still low enough on the self-esteem meter to get really fucked up in this one. So let's go. Excellent stuff. Well Gordo <laughs> myself and Miss you know you went you know, a podcaster extraordinaire as you are, me and Tom would have first met you on the stand-up scene, yes? Yes, sir. When I was young and impressionable and about eight stone lighter. Well, look, at I mean, that's kind of the story of all of us, really. Like, I mean, <laughs> whether it's actual physical weight or just actual, you know, just bad memories. Emotional baggage. <laughs> Emotional baggage. Like, I can't get on a, I got to pay extra to get on an airplane these days just for what I'm carrying. But you're looking. <laughs> Needless to say, it's all been, go- it's all been nothing but net. You know, podcast wise, in the last oh, couple podcast of years wise, yeah, shit, man. Like we we started in twenty fourteen and it went up and up and up. But I mean, I, I don't know if it's because of my um sparkling personality or my innate encyclopedia knowledge of conspiracy theories or my ability to be able to tell a very serious story in a very funny way with allegories about my penis and oh, and, yes. the, and the various bits thereof. Well, I think um. The, the the content holds its own. People are coming for the conspiracies and they stay for the dick jokes. That's the thing. To be fair, I've done a couple of your episodes and it's primarily dick jokes is what yeah. I'm there for. You Most, know what I mean? Mostly. Now, we have met people from comedy, music, politics, acting, mm. sports, mm. the world over. We've had actually very few from the comedy side of things. But please, if you wouldn't mind, make us all feel a little bit better. It's my birthday. Come on. Make us Happy feel a bit birthday, better. Man. I no, know it's your birthday. Much. Do the most Irish thing ever and give us an old dose of a story or two, if you wouldn't mind, from back well, look, in the day. Look, man, you know what it's like on the fucking comedy scene, bro. Like, I, I don't mean to bring the whole the whole thing down to a to a oh please do a, a harsh emotional level already. But like, there's a lot of people out there in the comedy scene that don't really know who they are or what they're doing. They're trying to find their voice. Say the first hundred gigs that you do, it's you trying to figure out how to not sound like your favorite comedian that you just watched before you left the house, <laughs> doing like. <laughs> In ace uh, cover versions of like <laughs> Bill Hicks jokes or some old fucking uh, Richard Pryor routine or something like that. Um, so many bad gigs because I, I I put myself in for it, you know. I I I and this is the difference between my stand up comedy career and Yizzer's stand up comedy careers, right? 
Um, I went into podcasting and it just by sheer luck, but also a load of hard work that nobody talks about, but like sheer luck that it just stuck. You know, I produced a lot of shit and threw it all at the wall and I just managed to find a particularly sticky wall. Right. Lovely. But, but you guys are into the craft of comedy into the working on the jokes, working on the bits, repeating them, doing them again, you know, shoring up the gaps, put, putting the fucking corners on it, putting the nice little, you know, putting the dado rails and the fucking, the frilly carpets. like Chamfering I was, it. Sh- exactly. Making it, making it, making it nice and smooth. But I didn't like that. That was the antithesis of the enjoyment of it for me, because I wanted the experience of like going in without a net, without a parachute, and going like, okay, whatever's happening tonight is what's happening. You know, the, the improvisational immediate uh, return from the crowd. But it's a fucking gamble. And in the comedy game, you can't really gamble. You're not okay. going to hire a lad. You're not going to pay a lad to come and do your show if you don't know what the cunt is going to pull out of his pocket. And I, I don't think I was alone in that fact. I don't want to name names. But there's other lads who could be very like successful as commercial comedians and be able to, you know, get writing jobs and stuff. But they don't want to hone in the craft. I, I didn't like it. And that's why I left. I wasn't good at it. And as soon as I figured out what it was and stopped drinking, like stopping drinking and, and, uh, you know, doing the shows, uh, really showed me what I needed to do to be a successful comedian. I, nah, I don't like this. I had no craft. I had no dedication really. So some of the worst gigs were the ones where I went out and I was trying like, Hey, I'm just going to talk about this fucking stuff. But I had no, <laughs> I had no specific <laughs> thing. Like it's like, Oh yeah, there's a vague notion of something, something, something. And I'd come along like I was cheating in a history uh, leaving cert exam with a little small piece of paper, maybe the size of the palm of my hand. And I have all the little things written and it was all like um, window wank or something like that. <laughs> or it was all like classic. I tried to be like a storyteller comedian. I tried to do like one linery kind of non sequitur, weird, you know, uh, you know, concept idea jokes. And then I yeah. fucking brought a guitar out and I started singing songs about like being a small boy trying to ent- sexually entice a priest. I remember uh, it was, it was a pedophile's uh, dream. A pedophile's was, dream was one. Of, yeah. And because you're actually a good singer as well, it made it all it carried. more creepy. It was like, Oh, that's a good song, but the content. Wow, <laughs> yeah. that's fucked up. The first verse, the first verse is like, uh, say goodbye to your wife. You know you don't need her. You know the reasons you became a scout leader. Like these kind of <laughs> things. <so. laughs> and uh, and uh, people people were all like, oh yeah, it's musicality. Hey, he's got a nice voice. Wait, what a, wait a fucking minute. And then for the first two verses, they're all like, I'm not sure about this. And by the end, I have the lighters out going, I'm a pedophile's dream. I'm young and I'm keen. I'm not even a teen. No, no. Like singing like, like at a Bruce Priestley concert. But sometimes that shit didn't fly. And I had to just power through the whole end of the song. <laughs> I did a gig one time. <laughs> I did a gig one time at the, um, the Exchange Theatre there at, at Temple Bar. And it was to a bunch of people like the A.B. Film and Bowman crowd. And yes. it was all like, po- it was a poetry night that they had comedians scars. on. And I came out and I started like with little jokes, like um, stupid kind of hacky bullshit. Now you think about it, like, do you ever think out of the 175 episodes of Bosco that there was only four episodes where they didn't go through the magic door into Dublin Zoo? I started to think it might not be a magic door. It's just a fucking door into Dublin Zoo. It's one of those weird things that people were like, ah, that's quite interesting. It wasn't it's a joke. Cool. It's a great joke. You could tell that to anybody. You could tell you that tell to it. your nan. Exactly. But it, and it's the delivery as well. And but but I wasn't willing to work on the craft of make of honing that little concept into something that would land every time. So that was, was it the a problem. case of fuck you if you don't get it. Exactly. Right. And sometimes I'd go up and I'd punish them if they didn't laugh at those type. I'd be like, Oh, you're gonna get like the the aristocrats now off of me. I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> I'm gonna fucking punish you with the worst shit my brain can muster nothing was landing and it was older people and they were like okay is this <laughs> performance art what is going on here Did and you- I started started singing the song and I'm a Peter say goodbye to you wife you know you don't need her <laughs> like fucking uh, 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 oh fuck I can't this remember is, the words you see, this is dream scenario for the other comedians that are down the back of the room oh because they were like, they're like in just choking ribbons because choking with the laughing 
you're absolutely plummeting into a building and you're going, well, what I'll do is I'll go harder with the rougher <laughs> stuff at him because uh, oh, fuck yeah. you and your scarves and you're clicking. Punish them. Is... <laughs> Punish them, try to. I'd be like, well, you're going to, I have four more minutes and you're going to hear the worst parts of my head for this. How dare you? And uh, uh, I, I mean, Gordo, who's, who's, who's worst gig ever is this? Mine. <laughs> is it everybody's? No. Is it theirs? I bet they, someone's audience, still talking about worst gig, probably. Yeah. I bet some of them still talk. I went to a comedy gig and all of a sudden I was getting <laughs> all of a sudden I was getting punished. <laughs> yeah. It's the wrong kind of it was the wrong kind of club. Uh, everyone's wearing leather and it was weird. But um yeah, that was that was like one of the worst um sober experiences. And of course, drunk, I could have been anywhere, man. Just going bah, 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 and and I started off with three points for courage and then ended up going into like, Ash, we'll have six and I used to do the the Battle of the Axe loads. Like Tony loved me for the Battle of the Axe, but he'd always put me on last. So in my mind, I don't know how many people out there know about the Battle of the Axe. It's an open mic night. But if you get put on last, in my own fucking deluded yeah. grandeur, uh, I was like, I'm headlining. Like, no, no, son, you're going on last because you always go over time. You say the worst shit ever <laughs> and nobody can follow you. And I'm like, all I heard from that was, nobody can follow me. Do you know? <laughs> and I'm on last, so I'm a headliner. And they're like, no, no. They, they used to give me the duck at the end of the night to make me leave so people could finish their drinks in peace. And I was running around the tables going, blah, blah, like, and demented. The, the entirety of the night for anybody wondering about the Battle of the Axe, which is upstairs in the Haypenny Inn, it could be anything up to 15 acts. So it might be three hours before you actually get on stage. So if you're boozing, oh, yeah, you drank all the drinks. All the drinks. Well, I was getting up, like, blacked out, motherfucker. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like... Just at about 20 past 10, I go over to whoever was the MC. It was like Eleanor Tiernan or Barry Mack or Gary Jones or somebody like that and go, uh, So listen, I've actually left my head. So whatever happens to my stage, I'm not going to remember it. Will you write it down to tell me what it is? Will you write it down to tell me what I did tomorrow? I'm trying to get my material nice and tight. Like, bananas <laughs> and i went up one time and it's not jack wise but there's another american his first name is jack and he does like he brings the audience up and he does these interactive like juggling tricks and all that's kind of almost like borderline kind of molestation i know the guy yes i haven't seen him in a long time yeah it's not jack wise now he's obviously very professional and uh very crafted and excellent this guy is kind of like a. I don't even think his name is jack it? i didn't know i know the you guy know the you're guy? on about can't remember his, I can't remember his name now. I do, yeah, and, yeah. And um, he was the MC for some reason. And he was doing like a bit. In... Anybody out there remember this guy's name? Let us know in the comments. <laughs> Please. Uh, I'm sure he he remembers this night off of me. Um... <laughs> I was in, it was Tuesday night in the Hitley, And he was the MC. And I think there was only six or seven acts on. Uh, but we started late and they wanted to finish early. And this guy was the MC. And he thought, well, there's only six or seven acts on. So I have rakes of time. To do stuff in between and we all know what happens with a fucking greedy mc he ends up taking up of all of the time with, that you could be given to the and if the if the room is hot all you got to do is go wasn't that brilliant you know what else is brilliant this next cunt give him a round of applause you're all fucking wet and ready instead of going okay Rick. like screech the brakes to try and soak in some of the fucking glory that the cunt before you had made you know uh -huh. And he do he bring these women up and he's doing all this juggling shit. Like, and it was all like, oh, can you feel the finger up your bum? Magic. And he just shake his hand in front of you, like, <laughs> fuck off, man. Right. So I got on and I had absolutely zero respect for this guy juggling and shit. And I was hammered. And I just started going and I was doing loads of fucking new stuff. And it was, I was smashing it. Now, it was very rare that I didn't smash it, to be fair. Yeah. Like, pretty rare enough. And the, the Hampton crowd were loving it. Man, I was fucking smashing it, doing loads of crowd work. I think there was a dwarf in the front of the in the front row or something Perfect. like that. And I was I was going into him and he had a hat with his flat on the top and I gave him a lot of shit about it. And he's like, Well, I'm gay, and there was loads of stuff about you know his mouth being a dick height. And you know, he took it on the chin, fair play to him. Um, <laughs> there you go. And um yeah, it's fucking wild. I talk about Thundercats and fucking Pantero being like the blackest Thundercat. People were like, Oh, bit racy. And I was like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hammered. And I went over time, as I usually did, which was really annoying for everybody else. I had seven minutes. I was on my 11th minute. And your man came up to the yeah. side and, and he was like doing the, the rolly fingers, wrap up, like yeah. wrap it up. And I was like, dude, this is the, I, everyone else has been shit. You're a dickhead. This is the first bit of good. Like, and this going on my own mind. This is the first <laughs> bit of goodness that these people have seen all night. Will you fucking relax and let them enjoy themselves? Like they've been suffering. They've been waiting for me to come on. Think about it. How good is this? <laughs> Now, 
objectively, I don't know how good or bad I was doing. <laughs> they all loved it, I, in my own mind. And he's like, roll, wrap it up, wrap it up. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then literally going like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this fucking guy to the crowd. <laughs> like, this fucking guy is wanting this to stop. Come on. And they were all like cheering. And I was like, that's enough confirmation for four more minutes. And I kept going, man. Oh, such a selfish arsehole. And then he got up to the front row and he sat in one of the front seats and he was just consistently just looking in the eyes, just doing this <laughs> for a whole minute. And I was just like, mm -hmm. and I was doing my jokes right into his eyeballs going like, I'm going to keep going. I go, I don't care. And when he started to pull the microphone cord <laughs> that you was, were holding that I was holding <laughs> so I was doing the joke and it's like yeah and then it was hey, hey what the fuck are you doing Try, and it became like this weird Laurel and Hardy kind of fucking it was bizarre right did he fucking he, he eventually got up on stage and went well that's it and I was literally like pushing him away still telling jokes <laughs> and he was trying to wrestle the mic <laughs> off me and I was like nobody Jeez wants this Christ. everyone wants me to keep going don't you and they were all like yeah like it was bizarre and then nobody wants this <laughs> and if that wasn't if that wasn't audacious and delusional enough right i gave him the thing and i went right fuck yeah see how you can do after that and gave him the thing and i walked up and i stood at the side of the stage and i stared him over and he tried to say thanks to everyone go, good night now and I went in from piss and I came out and he was complaining to uh, the barman. <laughs> yeah. Said, that fucking guy. <laughs> I came over and I, I literally, like I did that thing where, where you just, you're tipping over like stools and stuff, walking towards, and I walked straight like towards him. I was like, like, yeah, yeah, just tipping stuff over <laughs> as I was making a beeline for the guy after having a piss. And I went straight and I was like, see you, you fucking man, hunt. <sighs> Sweat, like, hot. you know when you get like over hot with so much alcohol, I was just like over hot, you know? You see you the fucking American one. If you ever fucking disrespect an artist like that, and you fucking, I was fucking killing the new fucking toy trying to steal my, you were up there robbing fucking cons glory for it. Fucking head. And he's like, it's it's like 12.30. And I'm like, yeah, because you were fucking juggling some mama's test for 20 minutes trying to fucking get a laugh at you fucking trick. And I went everything in. <laughs> Like this, you were. I'm an artist. Like it was, it was whatever had gone on in my head when I was in the toilet. I convinced myself I was fucking, do you know, the Andy Kaufman or, or Richard Pryor or something like that, where yeah. he denied these people art. Do you know? Uh, that was possibly one of my worst. This is not even my worst, I don't think, but definitely up there. I would you know? every moment of that, I would have loved to witness, yeah, just witness, because I know exactly because. The self indulgence that goes on in the in the oh, let me up the I I'm close like I there was a guy one night and he kept on referring he was hosting it and I was just popping in I was only saying hello to somebody he was kept on referring to it as he's an actor and he was you know Paul and Nick and he kept on referring to it as we're going to do the, we're going to start the second act now guys I was like second act yeah it's second act you know and he, but he was I was just going you know what you were perfect here perfect yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I cut, I cut my teeth in the battle of the axe like and then i ended up doing loads of gigs and loads of other play in, in proper clubs and stuff uh like not not like actual clubs like the international or whatever but doing gigs in like on show where in in killian is doing the same thing going wrap it up and it's like you said 20 minutes and he's like you've been on for 37 minutes and i'm like <laughs> i just i just finished up two minutes two minutes okay and then start a six minute story like it was just i was a, a bad cunt who didn't deserve the time and the deference that I got, but they kept asking me back. So I kept on coming back. I did a gig in Cork one time and it was very early on in the LV bar. Yes. And Gary Jones. I started Gary, the crack house. Yeah, yeah. Fucking hell, the crack house. And Gary Jones assorted me out for that. And I went down there and it was the first, I think it was my eighth gig ever. And I was used to Dublin crowds and I died on my fucking hole. <laughs> on my hole. I really, I knew how to pick them. Do you know what the fucking You did. Nightmare. You certainly did. Yeah. You, 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 all, you also knew how to write material that wouldn't age. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one I tell you was I don't know if any has ever did a gig in the tap. Yeah. Yeah. For, for Geo and Chance. It has. A, it, it actually has made an appearance. Jerry Jerry brought it to the table in our worst gig ever when we used to do it in the Tom and Jerry show. He did oh, a, a, a tapped one. The tap was some some alternate universe of society some kind of weird rick and marty style <laughs> portal gun job where you jump through and everyone is has become some kind of weird 
Cronenberg monsters. Like I rather. Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. have a point to play in the apocalypse. Really wants to pay not like the fucking tap man. I remember doing doing gig doing a gig there. I, I, I told them um, I was talking about Joseph Fritzl because he was just he was just gone to um gone to prison. He was just caught and he was gone to prison. And I had this beautiful Chaucer like um iambic pentameter poem that was like twenty five verses long. You know. And it was like it's all about jo- it's all about <laughs> Joseph Fritzl. There goes our uh, there goes our sponsorship with uh, Sheds Direct, Tom. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, Steel Taker's still on board. We're okay. We're okay. They haven't done anything underground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Steel Take. If you want to keep want to keep the damp off your family, <laughs> but in the tap, the the neck of you to turn up to the tap with any form of poetry, any <laughs> like. Like, it's why t- not bring that to the crowd in the exchange? At least they might have some grasp of what's going on. But that's like- what I think I went to the tap after that gig in the exchange and I ended up having to, to up my game a little bit. 25 verses. And people were like, what the fuck is going on? All the words are sounding in the tap. And then <laughs> and then I, I swear on my life, I finished that poem and people were like, <laughs> like this, right? And from outside, two lads had got fed up with me doing this crazy Fritzl poem. So they'd gone up outside for a smoke and they'd started having a row. And then the next thing, boom, the double doors open like a Wild West saloon. And two minimum 70, possibly 80 year old men did a full uh, quiet man uh, boxing fight all around the whole tap where they punched the fucking heads off each other while I was on stage. And I started comment- commentating on it like it was a, a, a boxing match. And then the barman came out and both of them sat down real quick like two schoolboys that got caught throwing pens in the classroom the teacher was out of the room <laughs> hoping that they wouldn't be barred. Like, blood was on the floor of, of septuagenarians while I'm doing a Fritzl poem. And I said, thanks very much. Good night. And Gio came on and brought Keith Anderson onto the stage after me. Like, that's the kind of caliber of the Knights of Comedy that I was involved in. That was possibly best and worst gig. That's I right think. up there with something you'd see in Stranger Things. Like, that's oh, yeah. the, that is the upside down right there. There's it's, it's something you see in fucking Shameless, Tom. Come on, yeah. <laughs> <It's fucking> bananas. <laughs> but I had, I, I, I literally had, I had, I didn't have enough respect for the craft. I didn't have enough respect for the people that were on before and after me. And to be honest, like, I regret an awful lot of the decisions that I thought were artistic or necessary as a comedian, as a podcaster. It's grand because you can go on as long as you want, but like. I think comedy as a craft, I didn't have the reverence that it deserved. I thought I could do it and I thought I didn't have to work at it. And it really like hone, hone me in on being able to like uh, write material and keep on point and keep on that kind of the structure of it to know what I'm going to say is funny. But like I couldn't do what you guys do. Like you guys have it like really crafted, really well done, great stories that are practiced. And it's like a song. You have to sing it a hundred times before you get it right. And I wasn't willing to do that. I was like, next song, come on, let's make it up. Let me go. <laughs> Make up the fucking words, you know. Um, so much respect to all comedians out there listening. Uh, it's not easy. It's fucking work. It's, it looks and, and the lads who make it look the easiest work the fucking hardest. That's the thing. But in all fairness, you, it wasn't your calling. You turned it your you, you turn you turned the corner, stopped drinking and drugging, and just stopped telling singing songs and poetry. Really, was the main thing. And Look you it. found you found the podcast word. I, I sang the theme song for those conspiracy guys. I just loads of I've loads of comedy songs still done. Like it's all there to be done. But I think um the one that springs to my mind, uh, Gordo, was you and me were doing a gig somewhere along the way, and the, you were singing a song. Yeah. And there was no fucking mic stand, so some little fucking doofus had to kneel down in front of you and hold the mic up to your mouth while you were playing guitar because he couldn't hold the mic, play guitar, and sing at the same time. Do you remember oh, that? I don't but that could have very well happened <laughs> <laughs> and it was a maddest visual uh you were there singing singing the song and some little fucking lad like this, holding it been, it up like this yeah like on his knees holding it up to your mouth that is... how do you not fucking remember that Carl? I, 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 that's what i'm telling you man like, it I drank, seared I, into my mind i used to drink and, and do mad drugs like the whole time and, and almost look at it like a challenge like if i can make them all laugh and walk off with a round of applause after seven points sure i can definitely do it sober like it's all this kind of shit, you know, wow. real kind of audacious, um, not unprofessional shite. 
which is why it got me in so much trouble sometimes. It's what got you on my on my worst gig ever, Gordo. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I do I I I think there's more people out there that remember worst gigs than I do. Like other comedians that are like, I remember the time you shit the bed, but I like those are just been wiped from my mind. You know, you guys don't remember any any terrible gigs that I did or any times I was an arsehole? No, 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 I actually don't. So I was in. Oh, I was. Tom, you're so I was, good. In, I was interested so loyal. to see. Well, I mean, your stuff, I mean, let's be honest, your stuff was was absolutely creepy. Like, you know, the stuff you were coming out with, like, there's no doubt about it. But I, as a comedian at the back of the room, you love it when, when, and it's not, maybe not always out of a bad place. Okay, sometimes it's out of a bad place because you love to see a comedian dying on his hole. But also, you love the awkward moments where, Jesus, when the whole audience have just a deep in take a breath, and you see, you know the comedian on stage is going, well, I have two decisions here. Either one, press on, or two, just run away and yeah. invariably Gordon would go well I'll think yes. of something worse to say to you now next <laughs> so that's the case yeah. so Gordo, Gordo's MO was just mutually assured destruction it yeah seems. but I'd, I'd firebomb the whole thing for it was coming on after me Um, it's re- it was really yeah it wasn't it wasn't a good way to be but I did, it wasn't my audience no. I put out this stuff out on the internet and these weird creepy fuckers and these mad cunts are into mad shit. They all flock to me like the salmon of Capistrano because they're like, <laughs> finally, finally, someone who's fucking talking about Fritzel and making a joke about it. That's exactly the flavor we wanted. <laughs> well, tell, tell our listeners, please, where is the best place? Where would you prefer people to go find those conspiracy guys? Pretty much everywhere. You could trip over down the street now at this stage. It's everywhere, isn't it? Well, this is yeah. it. We're, we're on Spotify big time. Uh, at the moment, uh, we're on all the podcast apps. So you find us by typing in conspiracy. I'd say we're in the top five or six. Mm. Uh, Thoseconspiracyguys.com is the website. And uh, there's like a magic link, like a link tree job that I can give to put into the description of this episode. Yep. And it has all the places you, you, that it can be found. Um, there's videos on Vimeo and we have a Patreon as well that has loads of stuff on it. Um, but yeah, there's about 180 episodes out in the wild, which a, pri- a prize is about 750 hours of content. And then there's another 450 odd hours in the Patreon extra as well, behind the scenes and outtakes and stuff like that. You could live your life, just listen to it. Yeah, I mean, if you started now, I think it takes 55 days back to back, something like that from, from start to finish. I mean, there's no coming back from that. But if you do listen to it <laughs> continuously, like there's just no, yeah. it, your brain your brain will break somewhere down the line. Like, like some clockwork orange shit, like you hold your fucking eyeballs open. And think. Well, listen, Gordo, thank you very much for coming along uh, and giving us uh, an, an episode to edit um <laughs> <laughs> thanks jerry i just i was just thinking of all the time i couldn't actually think of a gig that that i could remember fully with my with my compass mentis mind i couldn't actually think of one so i just give you a a, a, a tapestry of bullshit <laughs> of my, my time as a comedian dun 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 there you go conspiracy genius or not he's had a shit gig or two down through the years yeah, he has. He gave me plenty of gigs himself back in the day when he ran an unmercifully good gig in the mercantile. But of course, he has now concentrated himself and brought his humor over to those conspiracy guys. So I would I would wager that a lot of you have already are listeners and subscribers to it. But if you're not, subscribe to those conspiracy guys. If you have long drives ahead of you, I yes. would suggest those conspiracy guys is for you because anything shy of under five hours is a sprint. A sprint of a podcast for Gordo. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not doing too so, bad ourselves. A lot of ours are coming we're in not, close nope. to the two-hour mark. The two-hour mark, which is a perfect. Yeah, time and to if you yet. listen, if you listen to them, to, if you listen to two of them in a row, that's four hours. That's just how fucking sums work, Tom. Uh, but we will throw, <laughs> we will throw links to those conspiracy guys on our social medias. But if you're going to want to get those links to those conspiracy guys on our social medias, then you're going to have to follow our social medias you can find the tom and jerry show on instagram and twitter at tom and jerry show jerry with a g should get you something along the lines of it or you can split it up and get the two of us separately at tom underscore omahani at jerry mcbride some version of that will get us on instagram or twitter um as i always say in these instances hey stick our names in if it looks like we sound it's probably us yeah the, the, the picture is pretty class it's by rob steers he's an amazing artist cartoonist what? illustrator it actually looks like us, so you can't go too far wrong. Do hit subscribe if you're brand new to this. If you just jumped over as pure Gordo fans, you've gone, what the fuck is this? Have a look. There's five other seasons. We've just, we're, you know, we're battling all the way through season six at the minute, which is getting great responses. So feel free to keep those, Loads of good keep stuff. those comments coming. Lovely stuff 
on all the platforms from people. They're really loving the deep dives into these specific subjects that we picked. Random as they may be, but that's what Tom and Jerry are all about. We don't have any. What can I do? We're just into just some different things. And we deep dove into them all in this season. But there's five other seasons to get to know us a bit better, where we curse and swear our way through gigs and whatnot. And of course, just like today, there's a rake of bonus episodes there. Rake! Rake! I don't know what measurement is a rake, but a rake. It's a rake. There's a rake. A rake, is a, a, a rake is a small rip. Is it? Yeah. Fair enough. There you go. But it's twice. It's a twice. It's twice the size of a hip. <laughs> Hit subscribe <laughs> if you would like to leave <laughs> us a comment. If you can do on your podcast app, normally it's only Apple Podcasts and I think Acast. Some of the other ones are starting to open up to it. If you can, and if you can rate it, give it five stars, fail, and all that. Take a screen grab, tag us on your socials, and throw it up there. At least people will know. Tell them all at mass that Tom and Jerry sent you. Jer, that was another bonus Tom. episode. Yes, let's go. Let's go see what else we don't know, Tom. Mm-hmm.